Tonight is appropriate uh, to sing that song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound. Uh, they say if a wretch like me, I once was blind, but now I see. And uh, it's all about the blind man who once was blind, and in it, now he sees. We are in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John. And you should have received your uh, uh, version from uh, Colin. And we did chapter 9, chapter 10, also for next week. Uh, and as we look at um, this story, the whole chapter is about this blind man. But there are a lot of issues that we will consider, theological issues, different things that the disciples brought up as we look into this. So let's welcome the Holy Spirit again, and uh, you to Him, and allow the Holy Spirit and His angels to input into our lives, glorifying the Father. Father, we thank You for Your Holy Spirit, who guides us into all truth. We know because your Spirit causes light to flow within our minds and within our hearts. For no man can know God except by the Holy Spirit whom you have given to us. For the Spirit searches the deep things of God as the Spirit of man searches the depths of a man, so the Spirit of God such as the deep things of God and bring it unto us. We rejoice that you have created us to be in your image, not just physically, but our capacity, our soul capacity, our spirit capacity to know and to live and to demonstrate, and to bring forth, to create, to understand, to see as you see. We thank you for the capacities you have placed inside each of our human spirits and soul. And our bodies like Jesus cannot contain all of the glories of your attributes that you have placed within us. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for giving us new birth so that we are no longer of this world, but we are of heaven. And we begin to more and more in this end time demonstrate and live out and manifest all the heavenly attributes that belong to our spirit and soul. So that our bodies become the very temple of your Holy Spirit, showing forth all the fullness of God. We are your temple. And thank you for all your mighty angels, spirit beings, and all the various spirit beings whom you have created from all over the universe who bear witness of this end time move, who are part of the preparation in this great move that will usher in the fullness of the glory of Christ in your bride, the church. We are your church. We are your people. We are your temple, Father. Glorify yourself through this temple. We live only for you. And even now, open our understanding, flood it with light, that we may see all the glory you have placed in these verses and in these words. And let everyone who hear your word this night, hear the voice of the living God. Hear the voice of the shepherd, our Lord Jesus, calling unto them. Deep calleth unto deep. <clears throat> we thank you, Father. And be glorified through our lives, through all that we are. We are yours, O oh Father. We are yours. 
We bless you. Fill us over and over again with your worship, your praise, and with your glory of thanksgiving. We give you thanks, Father, in Jesus' name. And everyone say, <coughs> Amen. Amen. Well, let's begin. And as we begin, I'm going <coughs> to also create a little notepad uh, page on, um, well, oh, this is getting slow. And, okay, we're on this one. A little notepad page, get ready for the topics that we are <coughs> going to do. So let's look at John chapter 9, verse 1 onwards. <coughs> Jesus was walking, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Now there's so stories about this man in chapter 9. We don't find this man in any of the other in any of the other gospels. Jesus did heal a lot of blind people. There is Bartimaeus and uh, in fact Matthew records uh, two person and Mark records Bartimaeus and uh, many other blind people who are healed. <coughs> but this man for some reason his healing was exceptional because the healing of this man caused one of the biggest thirsts among the Pharisees. And you know, John himself says if all the miracles of Jesus were recorded, there would not have been any books large or any place large enough to contain everything. Which means he summarized and presse unto this summary of the Gospel of John. By the time he wrote this Gospel of John, the Gospel of Mark has already been circulating. Possibly Matthew and Luke too. So what he targeted was areas that was to, in his mind, in his heart, very relevant and he wanted to highlight them. <clears throat> Some things are the same. The, Miracle of the feeding of 5,000, as again John gives more background. Imagine the background that John gives is so detailed that you wonder what are the backgrounds of the other miracle that these disciples sometimes just mention once and then pass over. Here is one of the miracles that were not recorded in the other Gospels. A man born blind. And I want to state it first. I believe it's a creative miracle. It's a creative miracle. It is not a disease or sickness that causes a person to be blind. As you know, sometimes a person can see and then over the years, uh, an accident or some sickness or ailment, a uh, disaster that causes a person to be blind. In this person, I saw in the spirit, it was a creative miracle. That something was had to be created. Something missing, above the fact, such that he was missing some things in his eyes, whether an eyeball, or whether parts of the eyeball that is necessary, or nerve cells, that were necessary for a full function of perfect sight. <coughs> Remember Jesus also healed somebody else who was blind and then the person see partially and then the second touch brought him fullness. And this person is a totally different healing. Jesus was not interested in just numbers. To everyone there's a story. To everyone is a special case. There are no two healings that are the same. And that is the failure of Christians who learn gifts of the Spirit, healing ministries, deliverance ministries by formulas. You know, we humans always think it's a formula. <clears throat> as long as it's an inanimate object, that means a piece of metal, 
or airplane or a car or some factory produce or electronic part you can put a formula there because they cannot respond <coughs> but when it comes to a human being every human is different and every soul is different and if they have a spirit responding to God, even the separated, it's different. And every physical body is different. I have a book in my library that talk about the differences between all human beings. And they're not talking about soul area, physical. And it says that the difference in chemicals, the difference in the sizes of their heart, their organs, their tissues can be so different, internal organs. And uh, it would be like normal. So if you ask what is normal, okay, there is a range. Normal is not like every liver should be that big, every heart should be that big, or every uh, lung should be that size. No. Or every brain should be a certain weight and size. There is no such thing. There is a range of what is normal. And so the same. Every healing is special and different. And his disciples asked him when they saw a man who was begging and he was born blind. <coughs> and they said, Rabbi. Now the word Rabbi has been translated in some places as teacher. And, uh, okay, here they put rabbi too. And uh, sometimes it's translated as master. Actually, it's a, it's a term of uh, endearment in the Hebrew culture. Uh, they treat the person like, uh, a, like a lord or someone that they submitted to. So, which is why the translators will struggle to translate rabbi, rabboni in the Greek and uh, as either a master or teacher, actually it's both. So you could not choose, so we retain as rabbi. And in chapter 1, we didn't mention that. <coughs> and his disciples asked him in the footnotes, asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned? This person or man or his parents that he was born blind? Now these are his disciples, they are not strangers. And that brings our first discussion tonight. And let's see, okay. Our first discussion tonight, what we call partial theology. Isn't that an English, English phrase that says a little knowledge is a dangerous thing? And it applies to theology or a principle or a spiritual law. Sometimes people know enough but they don't know thoroughly how the application is. And they try to be too clever. And just because uh, they, have one, they have experience in one church, they bring the church experience into a new church at that time and say, I've got an experience, doesn't matter no, how many years you're there. Until you've been to more than one church, then you understand the culture. But you've been to several churches, it's different. And then it's different when you attend a church from when you're actually inside the main committee or the main board doing, making the decision. Plus, it is different when you actually have to start a church from scratch and build it up from scratch. It is also a different experience. And <clears throat> so many people, when they learn a little knowledge, they begin to think they are masters of it. And let me tell you, the only master is Jesus. We are all still learning. And a good businessman, the good teacher uh, will always tell you, no knowledge is complete. Which is why even in a medical line, if you're a doctor, every year you go to also go for courses. And you're in most of the professional things, every year you go to go for courses because things change. 
discoveries come, medicine change, and you got to keep up to it. And not only in the medical line, if you're in the computer line, things change fast too. Where suddenly, you know, a computer language is out of use and people are using a totally different language. And to be in that business or to be a professional in that area, you need refresher courses. You need up to date. Even in the business world, it's the same. Imagine today if you're still trying to sell, uh, uh, operate a little printing business. Gone! Because <laughs> everybody got printer at home. And so, the, with the internet coming for printing business girls, what about postal services? Now, the only thing that helps the postal services are people ordering things online. Anybody still writing letters? <laughs> You're now writing emails. So, you can imagine knowledge keep progressing, things keep progressing. In the end, on this earth, <coughs> Even the experts must not be too proud. Because give it another 20 years, you're no more expert. You're just an egg spurt. <laughs> you're just an egg. You have, you, you have gone backwards. You know, maybe a century year old egg. Sometimes call, accidentally call it a thousand year old egg. And uh, everything you learn is not archaic, antique, cannot be used. Uh, of course, there are some, some things that, that doesn't change, but there are a lot of things that change. So the same way, remember, theology and the understanding of God is progressive. The more God reveals, the more we realize we adjust our theology a bit to fit to what is true in the spiritual dimension, as long as it's backed up by the Word of God. So it's backed up by the Word. The Word is still our source. But no matter how many times you study the Word, there's always some things you never saw before until you experience God. And then you start noticing some things that you never noticed before because <coughs> it just pass you by. So, they asked this question because they understood basic theology that the sin costless does not come. That and that the curse causeless does not come. And that's a basic theology that's always in the Bible, which is why even Job's friend has those theology. Let me put a little search engine here, and I show you a little place here, the curse, and then we go to the end of the book of Proverbs, uh, which is a basic theology. <coughs> Should be somewhere here. Yes. And here's a little verse, <coughs> if they haven't changed, okay, here is it, chapter 26, verse 2. The translation put it differently from the old King James. Like a fleeting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. You know the curse of the law is sicknesses, diseases and all that. <coughs> So there's a cause, there's, there's a reason behind, there's, there's, there's some sin somewhere involved, some imperfections. <coughs> the difference is it might not be personal sin. See, this is where the accuracy comes in knowledge. So all the people knew when they asked the question, the disciples have learned something. That sin causes sicknesses. Now, or disease, or opens a door. You have Proverbs 26, 2, and then the understanding of Job's three friends is that bad things happen because something causes it. Agreed. Before, before Adam and Eve fell, there was no sickness, no disease, no disaster, everything was perfect. So everything became imperfect because of sin. You've got many verses, you can put uh, Proverbs 26, you can also put uh, Genesis chapter uh, 2 and chapter 3 and all that happened. You can put Romans chapter 5, how death reigned from Adam all the way down to our time. And with death comes sickness, disease and everything else. So you've got many verses that could prove that 
because of sin, death came, and death, with death coming, sicknesses come, imperfection come, troubles come, and, and, uh, and evil happens, and all those things. So, that theology, sin causes sicknesses, is correct. You cannot deny the fact that it's wrong. It is correct. It is solid. But as you know, some people they learn and they look at something through uh, maybe a telescope, a binoculars. But what you need is a microscope. But sometimes microscope also not good enough because microscopes normally cannot see uh, viruses, uh, atomic structure. So you have electron microscopes, which have disadvantages also, because electron microscopes, they, they find it very hard to uh, look at something that's alive. The thing that is dead, then you can see it. So it's a totally different dimension. But they're inventing more and more powerful microscopes with nanotechnology. <coughs> so that statement is true. I did not spend time trying to ask you whether it's true or not true, but it is true. So the disciple says, who sinned, this man or his father? So they say, somebody said, and true enough in, in life, sometimes when, uh, when parents uh, uh, live the worldly lifestyle in licentiousness, they live in immorality, they catch a, a, a STD, a sexually transmitted disease like syphilis or other things, and it can cause blindness in their children. So they, sexual diseases can cause problems with babies and they're born blind or deformed, it attacks them. Uh, so it is possible. A child can be innocent, but the parent's sin causes it. Or personal sin, you know, can take place. But the difference was, and here was where their error is. The, the mistake is to make this personal sin. Because sin is in so many categories. See, that's where accurate theology needs to come in. And here's where you can have, you have, for example, original sin. See, what's original sin? The sin that came in since Adam. We were born in sin. That's already an open door for sickness to come. You realize that? You're born in sin. Original sin. Or... It can be generational sin. It could be many, many generations, and then there's a defect in the genetics that's passed on for many generations. And at some point, it appears, and then it's passed on. Today, scientists discover genetic diseases. They can be passed on through the genes. Sometimes passed through the male line, sometimes passed through the female line. So some generational sin. Then, it can be, and let's get rid of these two, it can be parental sin, let's get rid of it, it can be personal sin, so we got rid of these two, right, can be personal sin, but there can also be a sin of society, for example, in the Chernobyl uh, uh, nuclear disaster, uh, a cloud of radioactive smoke was blown into the area of uh, Russia and also to Europe, all the way to Europe. And so the scientists calculate, well, there's going to be an increase in radiation sickness. But people wouldn't know. People wouldn't know, oh, because that sickness might appear 20 years later. Oh, you know, and, and like, for example, today, uh, only recently some factory polluted some river in Johor. The people and the school children, all those who suffered, 
they are innocent they did not sin but the community around them sin is the sin of society the imperfections that we make sometimes with every invention we did we don't realize the side effect even good people like Madame Curie who discover a radium <coughs> and and as a whole thing they died of radiation they didn't know how dangerous radiation was they died of radiation sickness but they have good research on x-rays but we didn't know the effect today we are inventing phones so you go from 1G, 2G, 3G, now 4G next is 5G after 5G, not enough, 6G do you know the higher G you go the more microwave that's going on in the air so literally you could be living in a microwave and it might cause sickness and disease that we don't know because no, and always money sells look at how long the cigarette companies deny that smoking causes cancer 50 years ago, 100 years ago they say no such thing and maybe when they first discover smoking they might say this is good for your lungs and you look at the advertisement long ago they advertise it good for your lungs after all it's a herb then now and the years later is the opposite bad for your lung causes cancer our human knowledge too slow to catch up by the time we discover something people have died these are the sins of society that we cause something without realizing we cause it and the people who are doing it didn't, pur didn't purposely do it although the one in Johor, that one purposeful but when, uh, when, when a new invention comes, we still don't know the cost like for example, when they invented cars how many people will realize that carbon monoxide is poisonous and who knows how many people's lifespan have been shortened because they are always breathing the car exhaust we do not know nobody purposely want to do that but each discovery of society has a side effect and so not just for sickness but for disasters too I mean many times we cut down all the forests and don't realize that it will result in floods and then the floods come because the, is the water instead of being retained by the trees and the water and all that and now it's being rediscovered they have discovered when there are trees and all that the same amount of rain come is absorbed by the ground, the grass and all those things there before it flows down but when they cut everything it flows directly down and when people actually die from flood and sudden water floods and all those things how many innocent lives die? because society in one section did something that caused an effect today they also discovered uh, hydro uh, hydro seismic activity hydro seismic earthquakes they found that when you build a huge dam after some time it will result in an earthquake because uh, of the weight of the water pressing on the earth and the plate of the earth can be affected and cause an earthquake it's now a proven theory after 30 years of research and data how many people die from earthquakes that are caused by hydro seismic activity sins of society <coughs> and then we also neglect the fact that sometimes spiritual activities can have a side effect a negative side when uh, when people begin to open doors to idolatry, demons and, and uh, uh, activities that, of darkness and with, with them coming they also bring sickness and disease <clears throat> of course long long ago it's always blamed on an, an F uh, everything was blamed on some spiritual cause and all that but that's not true 
and um, so or EFG it could be just a natural cause <laughs> don't forget natural cause because we live in an imperfect world and uh, as you you know, you so happen to be exposed to certain uh, bacteria and all those things and uh, by a combination of events that uh, for you, that bacteria affected you more than any another person. And it's just a natural cause. Uh, of course, you might put it under society kind of thing, but let's say, you know, uh, if there's no harm done, like for example, uh, how many people have food poisoning when they attend a function uh, because of neglect here and there, bacteria got through. Uh, so, not meant for that. Or sometimes, uh, food produced in a factory, they can be as clinical as possible, but a tiny little rat squeeze in, then got splashed through the chopper, became part of it. And we did carry some something that they, nobody even knows because it's all gone into means mean. <laughs> and the virus might survive. <laughs> you never know. And the bubonic plague in the end they found was caused by rats. Uh, the ticks that live on the rats were spreading the bubonic plague. Uh, so if your house was cleaner, uh, you're okay. If one rat got into the wagon and came by, went to your house, and then went near your bed, and the ticks jumped onto your bed, you got bitten by one of those things, the bubonic place starts in your area. Who's going to blame who? It's just a bacterial infestation because of a lack of hygiene. And sometimes the opposite, people can be too clean. You know, they are now having the understanding that a lot of um, uh, children that have suffered from simple, simple ailments, respiratory, everything, because uh, it's uh, now beginning to pile up as a data, the research, that by having what we call caesarean, and they taken out, and they didn't pass through the vaginal uh, cavity and all that, that when the child passes through it, they actually are exposed to all the friendly bacteria. So they actually grow up uh, a bit more resistant to sickness. Whereas the child clinically comes out missing some friendly bacteria that kicks up an immune system. And you research and see there's a whole section. Uh, that is coming up, but the data is still new. Uh, and so we invent something to save lives, and then we end up too clinical. Or people who are too clinical, then they suddenly realize that the baby cannot, should have been exposed to friendly bacteria to be up the resistant. So as a result, they protect the child for 10 years, the child never exposed to bacteria, everything is germ-free, and everything, so suddenly, one day, cold flu died. <laughs> because the resistance has not been built up. So all kinds of things, I can tell. So look at the, look at the thing. Partial theology is a dangerous thing. The disciple says, who sinned? This man or his father or the parent? They didn't know all these causes. They only zoom in on these two courses. Can you see how narrow they are? How narrow-minded the theology is? Now, good theology is simple, but it must be accurate. This is still very simple. There's more than one this whole thing support the statement sin causes sickness because these are all sin right? this g even g is under imperfection of society imperfect knowledge who knows a person in a bubonic plague time might have a pet rat not knowing that the rat carries a tick that causes bubonic plague 
and then die. And there you go. And I think once in a while, you've got people who keep snakes, they get, the snake ate them. So you go. All these things. How can you take a narrow view of a truth? So then you ask a question. How then do we know our theology is enough to handle our situation? How do we know? <clears throat> Remember, every truth leads to one thing, God. Correct? Because God created everything. He created every molecule, every spiritual law, every natural law. He created everything to show His attributes. Romans 1. And the Bible says God is love. All truth, and here's a very basic principle that is underlying every theology. All truth, all truth must lead you to, number one, to know God more. To know God, to become more godly, to become more godly, to become more loving. What's the use of knowing all the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and being an intellectual giant to discuss bombastic theological words that, that only 0.0005% of people understand what you're talking about and you do not have love in your life? You missed the whole point of what theology is supposed to work. Theology comes from the word theos, the study of God. So, even though our minds might not be giants, our heart has to be giant. Good theology produces loving attributes of God, because all the attributes of God are defined by one word, L-O-V-E. And so, even though your theology might be imperfect, and it's like the theology of Job's three friends. You know the theology of Job's three friends? Job must have done something wrong. <laughs> Correct? Because sin causes sicknesses and disease. Their attitude was rotten. Imperfect theology is cruel. And actually blind. And unkind. It does not demonstrate the attributes of God. So we don't need to be Albert Einstein or have an IQ of 180 or 250 to be able to know good theology. You look at it, what it produced. Jesus gave us the key. By their fruit, you will know them. Simple. Look at the results of knowing the theology. Look at the results of associating with a person. Look at the results of attending a church. Look at the results of being a disciple of the person. What are the results? Holiness, righteousness, love, closer to God, more prayer, more love for the Word. Then you know you're in the right direction. Jesus makes it so simple. Just look at the fruit. <clears throat> what will be the result? And so you have the tree, the tree of Job's friend, 
their theology was terrible. Remember what God said about them? In Job 38, God says, they talk nonsense. <laughs> I'm summarizing for God. They don't know what they're talking about. They really talk nonsense. But they have the theology that sin causes all sickness. Imperfect, partial theology. So here is his disciples who think they're very clever and they know a lot. Remember this, we will be learning all our lives. Even when we think we are a master or an expert, no one is a true master and expert. You know what is an expert in my definition? It's just someone who knows that thing more than anybody else. But that doesn't mean he knows the thing thoroughly. <laughs> so after sometimes somebody might discover something else and replace everything that person knows. However, before we can, we can disagree with the person, it is good to learn under that person. Everything you can. Then you know at least what you disagree with or what you can improve. So, an expert is just a person who knows a lot about those things or whichever area more than anybody else in their community or in their area. That's all. Nobody, nobody is truly thorough in their knowledge because all knowledge is progressive. And we got to keep progressing. So as long as we understand that, then we will always keep progressing. Knowledge. The the school of life is something you don't graduate from until you complete your life. And then when you go over there, you say, hey, they're still studying in heaven. Yes, in heaven there are schools. They teach about God. They're still studying up there. <clears throat> of course, there's a difference between the universities in heaven and universities here. Is the type of courses that people are interested in. In this life, people are interested in practical courses that help them make money or succeed. In heaven, the most popular courses are courses that explore about God and understanding God's creation. Because in heaven, there's no more, no more need to study medicine. <laughs> Nobody gets sick. There is no more need to study engineering because everything is created through thoughts. Maybe there is a department on studying thoughts, the power of thoughts. So it's a different school, but mainly about God. So here, impartial theology. <clears throat> Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. And we know there's a lot of other causes. But Jesus was not interested in the cause. <clears throat> Jesus was interested in the cure. And he said, whatever the causes. So Jesus confirmed that sometimes a sickness or disease is not caused by the personal sin or the parent sin. It's confirmed. That can happen. Yet in other cases, remember Jesus healed a man at the pool of Siloam. And by the way, this guy also was asked to go to the Siloam and wash himself. And remember what Jesus told a man who was paralyzed at the pool of Siloam. He says, Go your way and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Which means, personal sin might be involved somewhere. Every case is unique. Don't just, just have a simplistic, partial theology mind. Now, a simple mind is good. But the simple mind you must have must be uh, undergirded and founded upon a simplicity of heart. Not a simple mind that is founded on partial knowledge, partial theology. 
everything is caused by this, everything is caused by that. Ah, ah, that is not the truth. <clears throat> it's more wide than that. So we have that Jesus identified that the cause is not from personal sin nor sparing sin. But he says, whatever the cause, that the works of God should be manifest in him. In other words, God has, has allowed all these things at this very time and I'm here, Jesus says, to use this situation to demonstrate God. <clears throat> and indeed He did. And in verse 4, Jesus says, I must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. The night comes when no one can work. Now, that is a statement full of theology. You might not realize Jesus is making a very spiritual statement. Because you can misinterpret. If you read verse 4 in the natural, you got it wrong. Because if you read it in the natural, you will be saying that Jesus cannot work at night. <laughs> you say, night is coming, Let, let's go. Uh, night come, the moment the sun set, I cannot do a miracle. <coughs> we know that's not true. Correct? So if he's not talking about a natural night, he is talking about a spiritual night. Ah. And he says, his second statement, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So, wherever he goes, he can heal 24 hours. Correct? Because he, there is no switch. Jesus doesn't have a switch where he says, Jesus, can I turn off your light? <laughs> or oh, no, power saving time. <laughs> what are you talking about? It is not a natural light. Spiritual light. Behind it tells you how miracles take place. There must be an atmosphere for the miracle. The atmosphere is spiritual light. He gives you another tremendous thing. This whole chapter tells you how to have miracles, signs and wonders. Create an atmosphere full of spiritual light. Now Jesus says, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Today Jesus is no more in the world. He's in heaven. I know in the spirit he is here. But he's talking about physical presence. Who is the light now? Ah. Huh? We are the light. He said in Matthew, You are the light. You are the light of the world. A lamb that shines must be placed on the pedestal to shine, not be hidden in the bushel, on the lampstand. We are the light. We must learn to increase the light and here's the law that Jesus is talking about. <clears throat> if the light is a spiritual light, the darkness must be a spiritual darkness also. Correct? The logical thing. And as I say, you can, you can look at it logically. Can we interpret this as natural darkness? Cannot, because that would imply that it cannot work when the sun sets. And we know that's not true. <clears throat> Jesus still works. Even when the sun is not risen yet, at, Four, uh, around uh, the area of the fourth watch, which is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., before the sun rises, he was walking on water. 
Miracles were still flowing. But it tells us something. There must be spiritual life. Every place you go, in every city you go, the devil tried to cast the shadow of darkness on people. And as long as the people don't want to come out of the shadows into the light, miracles, signs and wonders cannot come forth. It must produce the light. You must be the light and know how to be the light. You go in our scriptures. We are not going to turn to all the scriptures, but I just quote to you. Second Corinthians chapter 4. The light began when the gospel came. Whenever the gospel is preached, it says light is shining, correct? And Paul says in Romans 1 that it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to bring deliverance the power of the gospel to people, the power of God. So whenever preaching is being done, light is flowing. All healing needs light. That's why Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 12 says that the signs of an apostle will manifest with much perseverance. And then you have an example of that in the book of Acts 19 and he described what happened in Acts 20. He says for three years he preached the word day and night. And towards the, the, the peak of that time, signs and wonders started happening. So the more word is preached because thy word is a lamb unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Word of God is light. What is Jesus' other name? The Logos. And the Logos was the light of the world. So when you and I have the Logos of God and the Word of God, we have the light. And here's a simple thing. Increase the light in your home, in your personal life, in your household, and the miracles will just start popping up. Because where there's light, God can work. But decrease the light, and the miracles are reduced. Like in his own hometown, he could not do mighty miracles. And when he went to Capernaum, he fulfilled a prophecy that say, Zebulun has seen a great light. Because he's going there to preach his, the kingdom of God. So don't, don't worry about the miracles. Just increase the amount of light that shines in your life. In your atmosphere. In your thoughts. In every place. Let no dark, darkness linger. Let the light shine. In the spiritual realm, there are, there are places of darkness that people don't realize. Do you know that if your eyes are open right now, the whole earth, despite the sun shining in the natural, is dark. The only pockets of light are where there is open heavens on the earth and streaks of light of God's people praying, breaking to the heavens. But otherwise, there's a layer of darkness that covers the earth. And over every city and over every place is sometimes a principality, a power, or a ruling spirit. I remember I described the one in Korea. Is that a, a, a woman with evil eyes and uh, whose teeth are like this sharp teeth, and but with the the face pale and white, with two patches or pink or red here. That looks like the Korean dolls. <laughs> Except the eyes are evil and the teeth are like sharp fangs kind of thing. Do you know what the spirit over uh, this place or this country looks like? Hey? Gluttony. Gluttony? Yeah. Sorcery. 
sorcery is a woman's body with two heads and under her a lot of beasts under her with claws and with sharp tongue and you know claws are things that lock people into, to, into uh, slavery and the tongue is all kinds of words spoken so when people yield to that they use their tongue for evil or words and all those things each place spiritual force is different as the enemy is exposed then you know the principalities and powers over the place so there are a lot of little soldiers under this principality and power and it's a, it's a woman's body with two snake heads coming up that's a picture of the principality over this area each place is different but whatever it is they are afraid of the light there is no power of darkness no matter how high even the devil himself there is not afraid of them, of light they are all afraid of light spiritual light so keep your spiritual light bright and there will be no demons that dare to come near you so as long as you are in the world you can be the light and as long as there is light, miracles can happen. Because the light will chase away all darkness. But Jesus said there is a time to work in the day of God. And there is a time that not to work. Remember Jesus didn't do miracles until he was anointed. And he was assigned to do it. So the same way, do not be in a hurry. Just be obedient to God and keep the light increasing in your life. The light of the word, the light of prayer, and miracles will just happen in the fullness of time. <coughs> so there's a background to the miracles. There's another theological question coming, but we're going to look at that. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed, the word anointed means to smear it on the person's face the eyes of the blind man with the clay you know what I believe Jesus was releasing creating miracles when he used very rarely does Jesus do that he used the saliva from his own mouth mix it with the clay and then put it into the person's eyes we're not going to do that of course we're going to say, but, and literally the word anoint is to smear it so Jesus took time, you know. You think Jesus just simply took clay and said, and then went off. No! Jesus took time to make it into pieces of molded clay. I don't know how many other times he go, and then it's so it to be soft enough, alright? Soft enough. And then he will wrap it in. The, the, the word annoy in Greek is a rub it in, place it. I believe he was actually creating a whole eyeball inside. <laughs> and he was releasing it, releasing it. The blind man must for the first time say, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> Nobody heals that way. Who knows, some of you might have the clay ministry. <laughs> but don't forget, it goes with the spitting ministry. So you go, and he made it then while the man is filled with this muddy looking clay all over his face Jesus said to him and says he said to him go wash in the pool of Siloam which is translated sand he went his way and washed and came seeing so the, wherever he was he had to find his way I hear this, you know, find his way, and here is he walking about with this mud all over him. Say, who did that to you? A man named Jesus. At least he knew there's a man named Jesus. 
So of course he got muscle, people might help him all the way. But like Naaman, who has to wash himself seven times. Do you know if Naaman washed himself six times, he's still not healed of his leprosy? Seven means seven. So this man has to actually wash and wash. Jesus did it so well that he actually had to take time washing. And finally, as he washed, finished, and he opened his eyes, he could see perfectly. Perfectly. Uh, he must have gone home. Because the neighbors, he did, here's the word neighbors, his neighbors, which means his house. He must have gone to his house. Therefore, and those who had previously seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Remember I told you he was begging. Some say, this is he. Others say, he looks like him. But he said, I am he. <laughs> As usual, people just cannot believe a man can be healed like that. Born blind. Genetic effect. This is a creative miracle. And you know what Jesus was doing? He was showing that he was God. Just as God could create a man, he could create anything. Wow, it would be wonderful the day we have new arm grow up. New leg. That God can grow. So, praise the Lord. What we will have, I believe, is as we preach, as we minister, as we worship, the arm comes up. I don't want slow motion one. So as they worship, you know, like the movie. So first you got the extension, like clay like that. And then if you are not persistent enough, all you get is a stump. The what? Here, O oh God Almighty, and angels of God, we want instant. We don't want. And then we got to keep singing, singing. After two hours, only reach the elbow. And then we say, "Wow!" Well, another two hours go. And then there's a clump there. By that time, four hours. Then for the fingers, two more hours you singing. And then you thought six hours not enough. Because you look at the hand, the skin not properly formed, fingernails not there. So another two hours, by that time, eight hours. Wow, all the so <laughs> Of course, it must be a glorious worship. Because huh? imagine as you worship, the arm is growing. Uh, we want instant. <laughs> Where just a part come in, and instantly there. Because God can do that. He just speed up, it might happen like that, but he just speed up in nanosecond. And the arm grows perfectly. For this man, for this man, I believe the moment Jesus anointed him with mud and clay, as he was walking to Siloam, the healing had already taken place. Not just when he washed, as he was walking. Remember? We got a, you got a similarity of the ten lepers. As they started going in the direction, things were moving. Here's an important understanding. Now this principle works whether it's by finances or healing or any breakthrough. The moment you start believing and acting in that direction, God already start moving. And that's why people don't want to believe until they actually see. They don't realize even when they don't see, if you keep walking in the direction, God is already moving. And you need to keep moving in the direction of faith and walk the walk of faith for God to complete everything. 
So this was a wonderful miracle. When he says, I am he, all of them Those who say, he's like him. Uh. Some who say that this is he. And the first question they ask is everybody asking. Therefore they say to him, how were your eyes open? He answered and said, see he knew Jesus. A man called Jesus made clay, anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and I received sight. So beautiful. Then they, oh, I missed one word. Then they said to him, sorry, I'm going to put that back in the shelf. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. <laughs> don't know where he went. Of course, he, he didn't see one. <laughs> the last time, he only felt the, the hands of Jesus. But I can tell you, that man today is in heaven. He's rejoicing as one of the few who Jesus spit upon. <laughs> it's a privilege to have Jesus do that. And he must have known it was Jesus because he knew. But he, of course he didn't see Jesus at that time. And here comes the main thing. In fact, this encounter didn't end. It ended in chapter 10. That's why I have to translate all the way to 10 to finish the story. But today we preach 9. Chapter 9. They brought him who was previously blind to the Pharisees. And that starts a new thing. And it was the Sabbath day! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> there was a day that was controversial. But you know what was wrong with the disciples and the, and the Pharisees and okay is that they they neglect another important aspect. Or what theology is. See, they have a theology of the Sabbath, and that's all they're interested in, but they neglect it. See, partial theology is a bad thing. So, I illustrated with that. And uh, The answer was still the same. They had the theology of the Sabbath. There are many other theologies, but they focus on the uh, what you call the physical ceremonies. What you can do or cannot do, physical ceremonies. And in both these two cases, the cure is the same. I repeat the cure under here. All truth, it's good to rewrite it, must lead to God. And all truth must Manifest God. And because God is love, all truth must be in line with love. They want to keep the Sabbath, but they are so cruel. In fact, when you read this story, you will realize they didn't appreciate the healing. 
They didn't appreciate the miracle. They didn't care for the blind man who now can see. They only care for their own religious customs. So this is another narrow-minded theology. If theology makes you narrow-minded and not open to thinking more biblically, and if theology makes you a cruel person, if theology makes you a Pharisee, your theology is a partial theology. And your ceremony is a partial ceremony. You do not know everything. You specialize in a narrow aspect. There are so many other commandments, but they keep emphasizing the Sabbath day. So many are commandments. Sabbath day is one tenth of the commandment. There are ten commandments. It's just one of them. The Pharisees don't even obey the commandment about honoring your father and mother because Jesus rebuked them for that. He says when it comes to giving you offerings, you know, you can empty a person's uh, place and everything, you cover just people and they don't care for the home. They only care for the Sabbath because by the Sabbath they can make more laws and rules and govern the people. Again, it's a symptom of partial theology. A symbol of incomplete, what I call incomplete understanding. And, and, and we need not have great minds with high IQs. All you have to do is, is that leading us to God, closer to God or away from God? Is the truth manifesting more of God in your life, bringing you closer to God? Is it in line with love? Because God is love. You can discern good theology from your heart, not from your head. If it doesn't vibrate in your heart that, you know, that this is indeed going towards God, you really know, know something is wrong. So let's go back to our Lord Jesus. And <clears throat> so they brought him to the Pharisees. And it was a Sabbath day. I tell you, the Father really know how to stir the Jews. When Jesus made the clay, remember a few chapters back, they were really angry at him for breaking the Sabbath day. And he opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees asked him again. You know, in this chapter, so many times they keep asking him. Until he also get very tired. So they keep asking the blind man again. They asked him, how he had received his sight? And he said the same thing again. He put clay upon my eye. Remember, this is a summary. He might have repeated the whole thing. A man named Jesus. He put clay upon my eyes. He anointed me with clay. I wash and I see. You see? <laughs> I see. You see? But they no see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees say, This man is not from God. Because he does not keep the Sabbath. How <laughs> bad? Because he didn't keep the Sabbath, he's not from God. What? And here it tells you something. When people want to reject you, they will always find a way to reject. They will always find, but you find that they're always afraid to debate face to face. Which is what Paul loved to do. If you truly know the truth, the truth is willing to confront the lies. So, their conclusion that Jesus is not from God is that he didn't keep the Sabbath day. What a conclusion. And Jesus already explained to them, on the Sabbath day, your donkey fall down, do you go and have the donkey? And they all went quiet because they did have the donkey. So you can have your donkey, I am helping the poor, and I am helping the person who is sick. So, is a man better than a donkey? Jesus already argued and reasoned with them. 
And all they saw it, he didn't give the Sabbath. He didn't give the Sabbath. They go, this narrow blindness. He didn't give the Sabbath, so it's not of God. Anywhere, not in my vision, the tunnel vision is not of God. Partial theology is a dangerous thing. They have a theology of the Sabbath day, but all wrong theology. All wrong theology. Because, you know what was I, I did not go into the details, but I could go into these Sabbath details as detailed as I went to the sin causes sickness. I give you an example. I use a different color so you can see through. We could talk about, in the first place, what is the meaning of the Sabbath? I want to show how sh shallow the theology was. The meaning of the Sabbath. Or the purpose of the Sabbath. You can show that even on the Sabbath day, they're allowed to gather the manna at the beginning. You know, and then after that on the Sabbath day, then they say, you gather before the Sabbath, but on the Sabbath day, they can still eat the, what they gather pre before the Sabbath. The first man who broke the Sabbath went out to try to gather. So, there is a meaning behind the Sabbath, and then there's a question of what defines work. What is the definition of work? They don't have a proper definition for what is not work and what. Until today, do you know the Sabbath has become so ridiculous that you cannot switch on the light? You know, the switch on light is work. It's really gone to the ridiculous. But it's been passed down the line. You cannot even cook. Cannot cook. Cannot drive. Now, obviously, if the whole country is obeying the Sabbath, you also cannot take guns, correct? So you know the enemy tried to attack Israel on Yom Kippur <laughs> while they are fasting? Exceptional cases. Essential services. On the Sabbath day, cannot close airport. On Sabbath day, policemen still need to work. On Sabbath day, bus and train still need to run. If you can have Sabbath, you cannot drive, but the train driver can drive. Can you see? There's no limit to how you interpret the thing. What, the, what is the definition of work? And Jesus' definition is, you know, he say the donkey fall down kind of thing? He says, where there is a need, you still can meet the need. So you can have the poor. It's based on a situational need. And of course, Jesus says, healing on the Sabbath day is okay. Because on the Sabbath day, they preach the word. What? So the preacher preaching is also work. What? On the Sabbath day, they walk to the synagogue. Why walking also work? What? Yeah. So what divine work? And healing is okay. Actually, on the Sabbath day, it's okay to do good. And then if you are a musician on the Sabbath day, you're playing music, also work what? So you can see, when you go into the details, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day of rest. It's not a day of bondage. Cannot do, cannot do, cannot do, cannot do. Wait, turn head or so it work. It's not man for that. So you can see, we can go into these details and we can analyze that the Jews' understanding of Sabbath was also partial theology. The Sabbath was supposed to be a day of rest, a day of worship. It's a good day. But they make it a bad day. <laughs> and so there you go. And looking at the situation, oops, I got to move this, synchronize. And here they are questioning him. Verse 16 was where we were. 
This man is not from God because he didn't get the Sabbath. But this is the first time the Jews are divided. That's why John wrote this thing. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. This division went all the way in, under John chapter 10. Now, may I ask you, remember I talked about theology? How can a man who is a sinner do such miracle? We're going to ask a question. Can a sinner do miracle? Because it's going to come out again. Okay, hold that thought. They said to the blind man, Again! <laughs> And then the blind man tired already. You know why? After he was healed, his neighbor asked him, right? Then he had to say, I am he. Then they asked him, how do you get healed? And the man put up, pop, 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 pop. And then, then he tired of talking. Man put, pop, 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 play. Then I went to wash. Then I can see. Then they dragged him to the... Synagogue. So the synagogue, a new set of people ask, How do you get healed? <sighs> he declared, pa, 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 pa. <laughs> And then I wash. And then I see. And then they all argue, argue, argue. Is he from God? Is he, this man is not from God. Then finally they ask him. They say to him, Again! <laughs> okay, they say, uh, what do you say concerning him? He who had opened your eyes? Ah, the man said, He's a prophet. Okay, he's better than them. Actually, he's better than them. But the Jews did not believe concerning him, oh, I must capitalize this, that he had been blind. <laughs> they didn't believe the man. The man can see in front of them. The eye go, um, 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 can see. And they say, ah, cannot be him. Lah. So let's, let, let, let's, uh, let, let's go, and, go and check on this one. And they, he, they, he and receive his sight. So they call the parents. So the parents came. Remember, remember all this takes time, you know. Yeah. Then they go and look for his parents. Who had, uh, parents of him who had received his sight. And, uh, oh, this one don't have to capitalize. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son? Whom you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know this is our son, that he was born blind. But by what means he now see? We don't know. <laughs> actually, they know. Because his parents, remember, he went home. So, actually, the first people who ask him will be his own parents. Because your son born blind, out there begging, Throw away his walking stick. Came back. Um, um, um. Surely the parents said, Son, what happened to your eye? So he must have said the first time, oh, no, A man called Jesus declared, He pa, 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 anointed my eyes, and I went to the pool of Siloam, I washed, and now I see. Yay! And then his neighbor asked him. So he says, Okay. A man named Jesus, he put clay on my eye, pa, 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 pa. and then I went to the pool of Siloam, and I washed, and now I see. Then he said, can I get that? Let's bring him to the synagogue. So the synagogue, the Jews asked him, Pharisee, said, how do you see? Oh, a man named Jesus, he took clay, he put it on my eye, pa, 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 pa. and uh, this sounds like a beauty treatment by now. <laughs> And I went to the pool of Siloam, and I washed, and now I see. And they say, you see, we don't see. Right? So, and so, they got his parents. So, the parents, the parents say, uh, no, we do not know, we do not, he is of age, he's old enough, ask him. He will speak for himself. And actually, everyone was afraid of the Jews. They ruled by fear. The things his parents said because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed. If anyone confessed that he was a Christ, he should be excommunicated, put out of the synagogue. So everyone was afraid of losing their place in the church. <clears throat> they threatened people. You, if you believe in him, out. So 
I mean, for them, the synagogue was like an old church they have been all their lives. So people don't want to give up what their comfort level is. Even for Jesus, I tell you, if people keep attending the synagogue, and you know, the guy who got kicked out is the guy who can sing Amazing Grace. <laughs> At that time, it looked okay, correct? Now we read about them 2,000 years later. I think the guy who got the good deal was a blind man. Better to be kicked out than to remain with the Pharisees. But at that time, it looked better to remain with the Pharisees than to be kicked out. Because it's a big thing to be kicked out of the synagogue. They got no place to go. Then, again, see the word again. Okay, give me one. Then again, they called the man who was mine and said to him, Give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. Wow. And he answered. Now he believed at least he's a prophet. Whether he's a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know, that once I was blind, now I see. I say, amazing grace. Then they said to him, What did he do to you? What did he do to you? I tell you, that man, he will say, Can't not you see what he did? <laughs> right? Before he was blind. And then, you know, they're asking the question like he was now deceived. He got a miracle. He said, what did he do to you? And then again they ask, How did he open your eyes? <laughs> How many times you must ask? And he answered, I have told you already, and you did not hear. <laughs> Why do you want to hear again? <laughs> then he really teased them. And this part is a translation. It can be interesting. Do you not also want to be his disciples? <laughs> Actually, there's a word not that's not translated. I compare the words. There's, there's a comparative translation. By that time, he was actually mocking them. Because in the original, it says, Do you also want to become his disciples? But actually, in the Greek, there's a word not inside. So he actually will be sarcastic by now. He went, do you not also want to be his disciples? <laughs> Let me imply that you want to. <laughs> he went one level higher in teasing them. He's like Elijah teasing the 400 false prophets. Stay this why they revile him. <laughs> they revile him and say, you are his disciple. What? Wow, that time he got a badge of honor. <laughs> because at that time, his parents still wanted to be members of the church. But he was prepared to be kicked out. After all, they asked him, right? What did Jesus do to you? I tell you, all he has to do is... Correct? No one could do that to him. That was worth being kicked out. He now got two eyes. And... Say, you are his disciple. We are Moses' disciple. We don't know who he is, but we know Moses. I tell you, if Moses is around, I'll give them slap. And <laughs> <laughs> they don't know what Moses was like. Moses was like, you know, give them a kick in the bum and say, come on, man. <laughs> we know that God speaks to Moses. Yeah. As for this fellow, we do not know where he is from. Now, by that time, uh, the man whose eyes were healed, uh, he really upset at this fellow. Because he's not going to defend the guy who healed him. The man answered and said to them, Why? This is a marvelous thing. You do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. <laughs> he really, everything was about his eyes. And uh, then he says, now we know that God does not hear sinners. But if anyone be a worshipper of God 
and does his will, him he hears. So the man refused to accept that Jesus was a sinner. He knew he was a righteous man. Since the world began, it has been unheard that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Now, is the theology correct that God doesn't hear sinners? It is, it is correct. Then, then, is the theology correct that a sinner cannot do miracle? I mean, we know that one day the devil will do deceptive thing. But in, there is an area of theology which show forth that Jesus himself, re, later when we reach chapter 10, this theology we will complete it. When Jesus showed that only one sign from God can do the works of God. Remember, he's the light of the world. We're not discussing deceptive signs from the devil. We're saying something is going on here. Something good. So they answered him. You were born completely in sins. You are teaching us. And they pushed him up. So you can see they refuse to learn. They refuse to hear. Even America didn't change their mind. How sad. A miracle was not good enough to convince the Pharisees. And they're still holding on. Sabbath day. Sabbath day. Here's a blind person's heal, lame person heal, you know, thousands are healed. Sabbath, Sabbath. What is these people? What's wrong with them? Which Jesus is going to say that statement after what you hear? When Jesus heard that he's thrown out, <laughs> cast out, Jesus actually went to look for him. So he knew spread. And when he found him because he was looking for him, the word found implied he's looking for him. So Jesus looked for him. He said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who talks with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Now, do you know his second miracle was greater than his first? Because in his first, he thought Jesus was a prophet. Every Old Testament saint would have recognized Jesus is a prophet. But his second miracle was even more precious. His second miracle he came to know Jesus, who Jesus is. Whenever you receive a work of God, don't stop there. Every miracle, every sign, everything that God does is to tell you how to grow closer to God. We have people sometimes have need. Remember the guy who come to our church and, and then he, he even say, when he had a need, he can call every other church, no one respond. We are the only church who respond. He received his breakthrough, his miracle, attend here for some time, but it's gone. What God wants is never to stop about on a miracle. But the miracle is a sign. In fact, the Bible uses the word sign to bring you closer to the truth. If the brother who had, who had been around had asked this question, why is it that no other church care for him? And he called several. 
We're the only one who respond. He said, look, this is what we can do. Bring, come to church. We'll pray for you. No one there to pray. God is a miracle. And if only he, we pray for him, that he continue walking with God. Because a miracle is only the beginning of your walk. Every sign and wonder, every physical blessing God gives is to bring you closer to know who God is. And that is the greater miracle. The greater miracle is to know God. And to be in fellowship and relationship with God. So that when you, this life is over, because miracles are only needed here. The other life, everything is a miracle. When you go over there, you continue to be close with God. That is the greatest miracle. And Jesus made this statement, which we say he's, he's going to make. For judgment I am come into this world, that those who do not see might see, and that those who see might be made blind. Every miracle challenges a person's faith. From this day forward, the Pharisees who had seen a miracle in front of them and still held on to their tradition, refused to let go and believe Jesus is the Christ. In chapter 10, they even asked him, tell us plainly, are you the Christ? And Jesus keeps saying, I already told you. They still held on to their tradition. No one can meet Jesus and come away different, uh, the same. You will come away different. Either you go closer to God or you go further from Him. Because rejecting Jesus is the greatest sin. If the greatest thing Jesus did for us is to die for our sins, rejecting His salvation is the greatest sin. And by rejecting him, they actually became a little bit or a lot more blind. They locked themselves into judgment. Now, they're going to be judged. Because before Jesus came, their judgment was that much. Now Jesus has shown them the miracle. Judgment is so great. When they choose to not see, and then some of the Pharisees who were already starting to believe heard these things and said to him, Are we blind also? <laughs> Next verse, Jesus answered. And that's the last verse for tonight. Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore, your sin remains. That means, once they see, they must make a decision. Unfortunately for many people, as this move goes out, they will have to choose. When we begin to announce about the glory of God that has come in this end time, that the Antichrist is already born in 2015, we have the voice that is calling people, get ready. You can either grow closer to God, but rejecting will go further from God. There is no more neutral ground. That's why we must pray for everyone that when the day comes and signs and wonders go out, when the day God commands us to go out with the signs of Moses, rejecting it is judgment. Turning is redemption. No more neutral ground. The mercy of God prevails until the sign and wonders come. So the purpose of sign and wonders, chapter 10 will answer us next week. And Jesus actually told them, if I don't do signs and wonders, you don't have to believe. But once I do it, you have no choice. Because it's right in front of you. And now you know the mercy of God. 
as he prepared us for signs and wonders. It's also a wonderful, most glorious time. But it's also going to be the most dangerous times for those who want to reject Jesus. Because they have opportunity to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Opportunity to reject the Word of God. When the Word comes with signs and wonders. So let's pray for the mercy of God to be great. That only the really, 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 really bad people like the Pharisees would not accept Him. But those who are sincere in their heart, who are teachable, who are in need of God, and who truly are sincere, will understand that when you confront the revelations and the signs and wonders, there's no neutral ground. And so we rejoice with this man today in the theology of how much he has progressed. But let us also be like him who persistently follow all the way through. One of the greatest evangelists of the 20th century is Catherine Kuhlman. And many interesting signs and wonders took place under her ministry. But even she said, the greatest miracle is to be born again. And the greatest privilege we have is not just the transformation of our lives, our bodies, so that every healing, every help, every power is available to us. But the greatest privilege we have is to know God. To know God the way Jesus knows. Isn't that going to be wonderful? We should look forward not to just signs and wonders. We should look forward to knowing God the way Jesus knew while He was on earth. So that when the Father talked to Him, He knew. And He knew God perfectly. We are to know God perfectly. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this time. Thank You for Your Word. Thank you, Father, as we are challenged by this man who was healed. So much that he started talking and declaring about God. We ask the God that you establish us in this grace that this man had experienced. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's all rise together.